That is moved, and now we are on to item nine. Kia ora, thank you very much. Got the presentation. And kia ora. We've got Lisa and Denise if you want to introduce yourselves and your roles and then jump into the presentation. The one that says talk. <laughs> As it turns out. Uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Lisa Erickson, I'm in the Strategic Advice Unit and I'm here to present the three yearly progress report and Denise is here alongside for some support and to help with any questions we might get. Um, the three yearly progress report uh, supplements the annual scorecard on the Auckland plan by taking a much more detailed look at the measures of progress across the plan. Um, it's important to note that the Auckland plan is a plan for Auckland and not just for the council. This report was put together at the end of last year using data up to and including 2022 as available. And in some cases, as you would have seen, the data is much older. Um, the last and first three yearly progress report was brought to the committee in March 2020, just at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we are reporting progress over what has been a very challenging time. Um, uh, with the pandemic and accelerating impacts of climate change, which is what the cartoon is uh, referring to. And we don't have all the data um, to reveal the impacts of the pandemic and other events, but the data does reveal some major impacts. The report does not account for the impacts of the re recent flooding events, but as you will see in some of the opportunities for greater progress, there's some relevant observations um, in there in light of those events. This slide that you see now and the next slide um, will show some of the opportunities for greater progress identified in the report. I'll talk to some of the mixed progress that we've seen um, across the outcomes that help with the understanding of how we have arrived at these 17 areas and that the specific and the full data can be found in the, in the report. Um, on belonging and participation, we, we see that many Aucklanders report that their quality of life has declined in the past year as a result of the pandemic and the cost of living pressures. Social cohesion has weakened and some of the measures on which we were doing well in 2020, um, such as trust in people and neighbourhood safety, are declining. More Aucklanders report feeling lonely and mental health is of particular concern. Um, we're also seeing growing in activity, contributing to rising levels of obesity and negative impacts on health overall. Um, and the disparities in health, income and employment that we've seen for a long time still persist and continue to be, have a distinct ethnic and spatial component. On Māori identity and wellbeing, we look at that Māori outcomes across all of the outcomes, but specific to this uh, outcome, Māori identity and wellbeing, We've seen COVID-19 having had a really negative impact on Māori in areas of health, um, education and employment. Um, these have now largely recovered to previous levels, but more data is needed to assess the full impact. Um, Māori continue to experience poorer outcomes and with respect to um, the transition and response to climate change, their concerns is this will exacerbate um, existing disparities that Māori are already experiencing. Um, in the Homes and Places outcome, you would already receive the Development Strategy Monitoring Report, so I won't get, go into the detail on that, um, but so we can move on to some observations about housing affordability, which at the time of the last progress report in 2020, we were seeing some improvements in housing affordability, but that's all gone with the housing boom that we've seen dur during the pandemic. Um, how it will play out long term, um, we don't know. 
and we know that prices have dropped significantly in the last year, um, but the outlook is still very much uncertain. Um, a growing percentage of Auckland respond, respondents to the Quality of Life survey think that their area has become a worse place to live in the past year, um, with the top three reasons given being increased crime, more housing development, high density housing, and a greater presence of people that people don't feel comfortable around. We know that urban green spaces are important to health and well-being um, and have a very important role to play in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, unfortunately, we have little data to report on the quantity and quality of, of our urban green spaces. Moving on to transport and access. Um, as you will probably be aware, public transport boardings are down significantly um, since the beginning of the pandemic, reverting what was otherwise a very positive upward trend. Cycling counts are also down, but much less so. Um, Mode share of public transport remains low and far below the levels needed to achieve our emissions targets. Um, and with respect to death and serious injuries on the roads, there are so, some indications of a decline, with the exception of cyclists, which should be a real concern as it's growing number. The presence uh, or the prevalence of cancellations and delays across the network um, has in significantly increased because of staff shortages, sickness, rail maintenance projects, um, and so forth. And as a result, Aucklanders report being much less happy with public transport. Um, transport continues to be the largest contributor to our emissions, um, but the transport emissions reduction pathways adopted in 2022 provides the way forward to achieve those emission reductions. In the environment and cultural heritage outcome, there is some mixed, project, uh, mixed progress to report. Um, positive progress um, includes increased tree planting in some public places, including the Hunua Ranges and decreasing waste, fill to, waste to landfill. Um, we would have really liked to report on the extent to which we are future-proofing our infrastructure and the uptake of green infrastructure, such as urban green spaces, constructed wetlands, green roofs, vertical greening, that kind of stuff, but it has proven really difficult to obtain data on that, um, although we are aware of some good examples of this in Auckland, but data is hard to come by. Um, on opportunity and prosperity, obviously Auckland's economic performance was interrupted by the pandemic. We seem to recover quite well in the late 21, 2022 or early 2022 um, in some key economic sectors such as employment, um, but tourism and international migration will take a long time to return to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, disparities remain in prosperity across Auckland communities and with housing affordability and the rising cost of living continuing to impact some communities really, really strongly. Businesses are reporting difficulties finding skilled labour and business confidence is, is low. Moving on to some of the dominant themes that we've seen across the outcomes and also in the opportunities for greater progress, um, these centre mainly on the critical need to address equity issues and on the societal transformation required in response to climate change. These themes are very much aligned with the key challenges in the Auckland plan um, and reinforces the need to keep focusing on those, so responding to population growth, reducing our environmental degradation and ensuring shared prosperity for all Aucklanders. Equity runs through as a key theme in relation to socioeconomic outcomes such as education, health, employment, income and housing, all of it play out spatially and ethnically. Um, the societal transition required in response to climate change has far implications across all outcomes, as you will see. This is seen in, for example, uh, the focus on reducing transport emissions, increasing the uptake of more sustainable housing, um, and the need for a much greener urban environment for enhanced climate resilience and well-being. These key themes and opportunities for greater progress are largely continuations of those that were identified in the previous three yearly progress report, and indeed they are just focused on long-standing challenges for Auckland, um, challenges that have proven really difficult to address, um, and meanwhile are just becoming ever more pressing. 
many of the opportunities for greater progress don't fall directly within the control of Auckland Council. It's understandable given, as we said, that the plan is not focused on Auckland Council only, but it's a plan for Auckland and Aucklanders. Um, but they do point to the need, these opportunities of greater progress, to advocate more strongly to government on behalf of our communities. And to wrap it up, you, you already moved it, yeah. Um, <laughs> the next step is that we will finalise the report and get it published and also um, use these opportunities for greater progress to inform the long term or the 10 year budget process and other decision making. And that's it for us. Thank you. Kia thank you both. Um, significant piece of work again right across Tamaki Makoto and I know this is not um, just about what's related to the council so it's quite a broad piece of work and challenging time so thank you. Um, uh, Member Henare, did you have a question? You're a team. Um, thank you for that report and in, in, in other times it would have been you know we'll all stand up and clap and um, but given um, uh, what uh, Auckland faces in terms of budget restraints, um, the mayor's wish to um, not 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 um, slash and burn, but um, certainly take the clippers to um, some spending. Um, and given what's in the report, like housing, more housing, climate change, culture and heritage, and how. Um, who do you reckon is going to come off come off worse in that environment? Through the chair, I'm happy to to take that, uh, Member Henare. I think uh, you have an enviable task, or the, the governing body does, and and uh, MSB members through committees like this to make decisions each year around trade offs and where where money goes and where investment goes. Um, so in, in some cases, some of the answer lies in your hands in terms of decisions that you make. Uh, there are other things, and as Lisa said, this, this Auckland plan is a plan for Auckland. It's not just council, the council doesn't have the only level levers or controls on some of this. And so it's up to other organisations, central government, uh, and all sorts of others to play their part as well. But of course, we can see the trends, and Lisa raised it uh, briefly as well, um, is that particularly with inequity, uh, those who are least able um, to afford matters or help themselves are often the most affected, and that also includes Māori and Pacifica in the Auckland um, uh, context. Given, given um, uh, all of what, what, what faces Tāmaki, um, and, and in particular the uh, Mā Tāwaka, um, do do you think that it's uh, that what you have put to us uh, informs uh, the council about how um, future Maori impact statements uh, are, are developed? Through the chair, look, I think that's a really um, important challenge and reminder to us as staff and, and obviously committees as decision makers about how we assess the impacts of policy or decisions uh, on, on others, and in, in this case, particularly Māori. Uh, this is exactly why we do this work, is to inform things like that and ultimately to inform our advice, which, which assists you in making decisions. So I'm going to take that firstly as a challenge um, to improve that at our end uh, and also to ensure that these issues are brought up um, whether it's in budget conversations or continued committee work um, where policy decisions are being made and what the effects might be on particular peoples. Good on, Megan. Through the Thank Chair, you. could I just also add that um, in particular the, the data that's going to come through in the next census um, and take a pinger um, you'll note that there's a lot of data which is from 2018, so I think we'll be continuing to monitor that and get more data which will also help to inform those Māori impact statements. Considering that uh, there's, there's been quite a jump uh, in the Māori population in Tāmaki since 2018, or in, eight, in, 
in, in regards to what it was in 2013, um, something like 26, 27 per cent off, off the top of my head. Um, so it'll, it just makes it, um, um, and we've got all the data, and we continue to get data. Um, and, and, and I know, I know that council on its own ain't going to solve the issues of uh, disparity between Māori and non-Māori. Um, but, but having the, the wheels of, of council at your back helps tremendously. So, so, so when you hear me um, rail against um, uh, what we're not getting, it's not, it's not actually a, 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 an attack on council. It's most probably um, comes from a, a position of, oh, here we go again. And, and I suppose what, what worries me is that, and I know that for most Aucklanders, um, we, we, are, we are fronting not only what happened in COVID, but also what happened in anniversary weekend, but also in Gabriel. And who knows what's coming next? And, and so, you know, our priorities are the wider tamaki. But if I was to go back to 1950, my priorities, if I was alive, my priorities would have been Māori, housing, employment, education, the same things over and over again because we're, we're always behind the eight ball. And it's why I asked that initial question, who do you think is going to suffer? And, I, and that was a bit of a, a naughty question, but... Well, thank you very much. And and uh, very fair uh, questions, Member Hanaday, and I know it is, and that's why obviously Megan stepped in, because it is hard for staff to comment on our decisions on the budget, um, which are political, not structural, I guess. But I think there is a discussion that I think Councillor Darby and Councillor Dalton have brought up and others around what, how was the Auckland plan? Was that a lens that was put on the budget process? How was it decided? Why wasn't it included? And I think maybe, and I'm not speaking for IMSB, but maybe uh, 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 IMSB could, or the directorate could ask in the next couple of months for a response to um, how the potential cuts and reductions will affect Māori communities specifically, but maybe others as well. And we could do... I think there is a, a case for us to try and get more information on the impacts and who it impacts, but... Yes, so uh, definitely a good point. Uh, Councillor Walker. Just got a couple of questions, and um, I don't pretend to be familiar with the, you know, the criteria, but um, I look at tree planting, and it mentions you know, there's increasing biodiversity and native forest cover. Um, uh, my concern is that's against the background when we know that there's an overall loss of canopy cover across Auckland every year. You've only got to listen to the chainsaws um, going. Um, uh, so my understanding is that we can measure that. Um, you, know, you can measure it from satellite analysis and uh, the like, and we've had previous studies, so just got a question about that. Um, the other thing that is, is occurring within environment is I'd suggest um, significant increases in sedimentation that are entering our coastal marine uh, areas, which is of uh, huge, con huge concern. They're being exacerbated by the storm events and um, uh, land use that's occurring everywhere in virtually every catchment, particularly driven by Plan Chain 78 and intensification. Uh, it's self-evident everywhere. You, you know, observe a storm event. So I've just got a question around how we're reporting against that. The other thing that... Um, I took an interest in because I was on the heritage panel. Obviously, we don't have a heritage panel anymore. We've downgraded our uh, built heritage. But the observation that people bring to my attention is that we're suffering a loss of um, a loss of our built heritage. Um, conceivably, that could be accelerating through plan change um, 78. I'd expect us to have some reporting on that. And I know that they're not. Um, desirable things to happen, but they're realities. And unless we actually report on realities, we don't get the feedback loop and the public awareness and the political drivers that drive us 
to affect change because the public is ignorant and we're ignorant. So just ask your response on those four um, topics I've, um, I've raised that are certainly observations, myself and others, and especially environmental and heritage groups are observing. Thanks. Um, through the chair, I can answer definitely on the tree cover that I'm aware that well, I know we have only got tree cover data up to 2018, 2019, um, which showed overall there was actually no, mu not much change from 13 to 18, um, but in some local board areas there was definitely a loss, and in others um, unchanged, and in others actually there'd been an improvement in tree cover. Um, Overall, there was a loss of tree cover on private land, which won't surprise anyone. Um, with, like you're saying, you can hear the chainsaws, and we do have an estimate that we quote in a report from the Tree Council that estimates about a thousand trees a week, or mature trees a week. Um, it's, it's, it's mature trees. Yes, yes, and um, yeah, on public land, we've seen an increase in planting, but that's not a mature tree, and we know that it takes three decades to realise the real benefits of trees. So um, as far as your question on the heritage and the loss of built heritage, um, it's not something that's included in the report, but it's something that we can go away and, and look at and come back on. Um, sedimentation, also not something that's included in here, but something that's it's a good it's, it's, good, it's, it's measurable, measurable and yeah. it's something that may well be captured in the State of the Environment court, uh, report um, and we could look to include that in, in here. Yes, it's in the State of Environment report, the sediment. Yeah. It was three questions and I think you just said you had four and I can't remember what the fourth was. And just on the trees, I know the last, the last study we... Okay, thank you. The report from the last study, I think, showed Councillor Walker a 0.5% increase in canopy cover across Auckland up to 183 or 4% coverage. And so that's about 60 hectares of increased tree cover, but that was mostly on public oh, land. Yeah. And we and were... And small, we were, real small stuff, Mr Chair. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we were getting a significant drop in the, the significant trees on private land. Mm. So mm. it is, we are pulling our weight on the public, but we know there's an issue with the private. Yeah. And we presented, again, uh, Councillor Dalton and um, myself and Megan and John to the RMA Select Committee on Monday, Tuesday, um, further pushing for urban tree protection. Yeah. And we got a good hearing, and I'm also hearing both sides of Parliament mm. thinking that there may be possibilities for that in the future. They've, they are hearing us, which is good. My, uh, my commendations on your response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member Ashby. Kia ora. Thank you for your uh, report. Um, I uh, just wanted to focus in on the um, Māori heritage findings just for a moment. Um, and in terms of uh, you've got three, I guess, rooms for improvement um, under the Māori outcomes um, which is which is good that those are marked. I'm very interested in, in how you get there and any advice um, that you might give us. I know that's a big loaded question, but um, just to narrow in on the heritage, uh, Māori heritage sites, we're currently scheduling at a rate of about 32 sites every five years. There's about 2,800 historic heritage sites in the unitary plan. So if my math's correct, and might, I'm not a mathematician, so I might be wrong, but um, at that rate, I'll be 450 years old by the time the Māori heritage catches up to the um, non-Māori heritage in terms of scheduling. So um, there's something very wrong with that picture. Um, so what could be done to, um, given, given the... Uh, we've spent many hours today talking about, um, you know, growth and things like that, which is which has a number of, of um, positive and negatives on, on our communities. But one of the negatives is often the erasure or subdivision and, and um, dislocation or separation of of, of um, kaitiaki from the wahi tapu. So, what could be done to increase that that rate? I'm really interested. I know it's been a bit of a struggle for a long time. So. Um, We've, we've got to up, up, up that rate quite quickly. And also, um, 
know that previous plan changes being focused on public land, which um, I just wonder what how this council might be a bit bolder um, and a bit faster. So uh, any thinking and that would be much appreciated. Through the chair, kia ora, Member Ashby, maybe if I could just respond initially anyway. Uh, we do have a team, uh, as you know, we uh, and that's funded through the Māori Outcomes uh, Fund uh, to work uh, directly with iwi uh, on Wahitapu and to schedule those under the unitary plan. Uh, and yes, we focused on public land first in the sense that that is easiest because uh, Council owns the land and controls it, uh, and, and you will know... Uh, that in many instances is much harder than when there is heritage um, uh, to be um, scheduled on private land. Um, yes, it takes a long time. Uh, so whether that's working with iwi and, and ensuring that uh, they are uh, feel comfortable in giving us information and ensuring that the location is correct and, and all of the elements around that site uh, and the history of it is important, and then, of course, when you add in uh, private uh, owners, that can also add time. So um, it might be something we might want to take offline in the sense of if you have any ideas as well or the IMSB have any views about how we can speed it up, apart from putting a whole lot more people or budget on it, there's, it will still take a lot of time because it's um, pe people heavy quite appropriately too, particularly we're working with iwi and their capacity in order to work too. So a semi-answer for you. Um, a supplementary to that would be, um, why not put off trying to schedule on private land and go um, hammer and nails at what you do own in terms of the, what, what the council's ownership is? Can I can I take that back and come back to you? Yeah, thanks. Kia ora. Um, thank you, Councillor Ferry. Thank you. Um, uh, just also noting um, further to uh, my IMSB colleagues. Um, the queries about um, the data for Māori, I'm very aware the last census did not do a great job uh, in terms of collecting data for Māori. There are some concerns that that might happen again, so I just wanted to highlight um, that. The point you made right at the start about this being um, a plan for all of Auckland, not just for Council, what are we doing to actually connect this plan to those other parts of Auckland that we need to um, work on implementation that, that we may be a partner in or we may play a small role in or we may play no role in. Um, what are we doing to, to have those conversations? Because it's great that it comes here and there's some accountability to us and some oversight, but we really need to um, start getting some of the stuff happening out there in the other parts that we don't control that we can then leverage. Because um, as To said, a lot of this is outside our immediate mm. control. So what are we doing there, you know, with central government, with other agencies, with our communities? So it's a very big question for you. Thank you, Councillor Ferry. Through the chair, I think it's a really good question and I don't think I've got anything um, very concrete I can say in response. I guess there's some obvious areas with that the plan drive where we're working very closely with government and things like ATAP. Um, and some of those big program areas, um, and some areas around homelessness um, strategies working working together. Um, and obviously we are working um, with the community um, through various initiatives that the council has, and all of those things are helping to contribute to, to the outcomes that we're seeking with the plan. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thanks, Councillor Ferry. Yeah, just a, a general question. I mean, I mean, this makes for pretty grim reading. I mean, at the, the risk of stating the obvious, if I was reading this about a city, I'd be saying, "Jeepers, creepers! These dudes have got a few problems." What, what, what happens? What happens with this now, as far as it, you know, getting out in, into the public? You I mean, use it to convince yourself that there's no need to cut the budget. I, I, to be to be fair, I think there's a lot more needing addressed here than the Auckland Council budget. 
So, so I'm just a, a genuine question as to what happens with you know this this information that is really quite telling in a number of very fundamental ways. Uh, th thanks, Councillor Watson. Through the chair, um, the, one of the uh, we decided to do this report when we first adopted the Auckland plan. So we do an annual scorecard where we talk, um, use a, a smaller number of measures to report progress, and then every three years take this deeper look into the plan. And one of the reasons we do that is to um, is because the plan is supposed to provide the basis for alignment of our um, funding plans. And um, so we use we produce it at this point to help to inform the 10-year budget. Um, but as but as it has been commented on several times today, this isn't just a plan for Auckland Council, this is a plan for Auckland. It's a 30-year plan. Um, we are trying to show what progress has been made to date. And we are trying to demonstrate that there are particular areas based on the data where we think um, further progress could be made. So those are those 17 opportunities for greater progress. Okay, thank you. And just, just a couple of quick follow-up ones. I mean, uh, certainly in terms of the economic indicators that you know really go to the quality or lack thereof of people's lives, obviously, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's one for the government and, and, and people th themselves, largely. I, I think of the, the areas that Council does have, you know, an immediate bearing on, and we, we, we have referred to them. But I guess the other thing that, that I just would ask in terms of, you know, full capture, there are things there that Aucklanders themselves can step up to, aren't they? And, and we perhaps could maybe spell that out a little bit more. So I think of belonging and participation. We talked about COVID, the effects of COVID, but for a little while in COVID, people were actually closer together. There was more community feeling, there was more community resilience. There was a kind of a little bit of a throwback to the good old days and that's gone you know? So as much as we can point a finger at government and councils, we, we, we've got a part to play in that. And I think even with some of the council ones, even like the transport, we talk about public transport here and, um, you know, how it's it's on the back foot, and we, we know that to a certain extent. But there's also half-price fares there. So you'd think, OK, you know, what does it take to get someone to, to go and use a public transport? It's half-price. Uh, what, does it have to be free, or, or do you have to pay someone to get on the bus now? So... It, it might be nice if, if, if there was a little bit of a balancing there as to, uh, you know, notwithstanding the very real divisions and equities that, that are outside the people's control, there are things there that Aucklanders could be doing too, and we, we should perhaps consider that in some ways. And one of the opportunities for greater progress in that belonging and participation area is about that supporting communities to be more resilient. And in many instances, communities are looking for practical support from council to help shape and influence different things that they're doing. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you. Thank you for the report. I am not surprised at all by it. Um, that's exactly what I'm seeing out there in the communities. Um, and I just, I, I didn't want to read this report, to be honest, because I don't know what we can do with it to actually affect some real change to address this, considering what is being cut in the, well, what is being proposed to be cut in the budget is all our community services. So um, I suppose my question is, you know, what, what, what can we do? Like, this is exactly what we're seeing, the inequities, the, um, there's no community resilience for some communities. You, you, you've got, what, 7,000 that, lost their homes, and how many of those had no other option but to live in their cars? Um, you know, they don't have a holiday home to go to or, you know, money to go into a hotel, so they went into their cars. So there, there, there's major issues. Well, what can we do with it to really make some change happen? Even, even if because it's obvious things are going to be cut. What, what, a, what about a leadership role that we can take? Uh, through the chair, that might be slightly rhetorical, but I, uh, you're right. I think ultimately it comes to what, is, what can council do and what can we do best? 
uh, in some of these areas. We don't have to do everything. We can't do everything. And in fact, there are others. Sometimes it's community themselves, it's, or it's other organisations that do it better than us. So in one, in one sense, the question was, what, can, what do we do well? What do we do best? And therefore, is that going to be a priority for investment, whether that's money or time or leadership, whatever that looks like? Um, is that going to be a priority for this council? Um, so that's the kind of reason why we put this together, because it can help as you think through, particularly into budgets, but into your general leadership as well as to what this council uh, could focus on or should focus on and what it does really well versus getting out the way and letting others do some stuff. Yeah, a good point, Councillor. I think it is it is using some of this information for, I guess, your advocacy and our advocacy to community through the, the process of the budget and debating on the budget. But I guess it is hard for staff once again to react to our decisions, um, because when those decisions, if those decisions are made, they just have to, unfortunately or fortunately for them, um, have to just follow what we've decided. Um, so I guess that's a question for all of us looking through some of this bleak data. I just had one question um, but on climate. So we have, um, it's pretty bleak on there around our emissions. Uh, we've got climate disclosure reporting, compulsory reporting, but we've already been doing it anyway, um, coming up. And we know that uh, services are being cut and Auckland Transport is not completing and they're delaying and cancelling walking and cycling projects um, and not completing for all the years I've been here anyway, things like transit lane, cycle lays, anything that they've sort of said they haven't really got to, especially in the emission space. What does this document, as it's a statutory docu document, not like Te Tarakia Tafari, despite we've all approved it, that's not statutory. Does this have any legal obligations around emissions and sort of triggers that, you know, forcing us to make actual decisions that reduce our emissions, or our CCOs to do that? Uh, no, I, it doesn't have that. Um, well, yeah, sorry, that's quite a hard question. Um, it doesn't have that um, statutory weight to do that, I think would be the clearest answer I could give. It sets direction. Um, that direction is picked up in other documents such as Te Tāraki um, And through this um, report, reporting on that, we can identify where there are areas where we could be making improvements. Um, but the, the document itself, and certainly the monitoring report, doesn't have that um, statutory weight. Um, the, the, what the legislation talks about is providing the basis for alignment of our regulation, uh, regulatory plans, our funding plans, and our implementation plans. So um, we, we try and provide this information so that those can be aligned. Yeah. So if, maybe it is a legal question, not a question it, it, for... It might be. I'm not sure if I've answered that quite yeah. correctly, but that's my understanding. Yeah, I guess my concern, maybe it's to you, Megan, that if this doesn't trigger... If, so we've support this, support Te Tāraki Tāwhiti, support transport emissions um, reduction pathway, but a organisation such as Auckland Transport or Waka Kotahi can still ignore those. Where does the, where does the line go? Yeah, so the Auckland plan is statutory, so it does sit in, in the Local Government Act kind of legislation for Auckland. Um, and, and it does have climate woven through it, because climate, yes, there's an, the environment or the natural environment type element to climate, but, but uh, a very large part is also, you know, a, a social and economic uh, and a cultural aspect to it as well. So it's woven through um, the, the whole Auckland plan and, and most of those six outcomes. As you know, central government kind of cascades a bunch of documents and things that we have to do, and particularly under the Resource Management Act, but not exclusively, but particularly under that, uh, we are required to deal with, uh, for example, to deal with climate change and, and point to direction. We've got um, emissions reductions we're required to do and things like that. So that's where you see some of those uh, uh, specific meaty kind of things coming through, not so much at the spatial plan. 
but the requirements are statutory and they come down through some of these other documents as well. So they do play together um, and come together under the Auckland plan, uh, but most of that specificity comes under these other documents and other pieces of legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, last question, Councillor Lee. Mr Chairman, I'd just like to um, add um, a contribution here because I believe um, the Auckland plan um, properly interpreted um, can help or could help um, us, guide us in the challenges we face in terms of the infrastructural deficit that has been underlined by the recent extreme weather events. And just to remind members that the actual name, the real name, the legal name of, of, of the Auckland plan is the spatial plan for Auckland and is set out in the Act, Local Government Act 2009 for the purposes of subsection two, the spatial, spatial plan will set a strategic direction for Auckland and its communities that integrate social, economic, environmental and cultural objectives and outline a high level development strategy that will achieve that direction and those objectives and enable coherent and coordinated decision making by the Auckland Council as the spatial planning agency and other parties to determine the future location and timing of crucial, critical infrastructure, services and investment within Auckland in accordance with the strategy and provide a basis for aligning the implementation uh, of the plans, regulatory plans and funding programs for the Auckland Council. So I think we need to go back to basics and view this plan for what Parliament intended it to be. And I think if we look at it in that light, um, in terms of critical infrastructure services, um, the timing of development and so on, it could be uh, helpful for us as we, face as, as we face the immediate challenges ahead, in, including the long-term challenges. But I think we, we seem to be drifting away from what the Act requires us to do with this plan, and probably it's timely um, we went back to the Act to, to seek some guidance here and measure our success against what the Act requires us of us. Even mention of flood prone or unstable land is in here. It's, it's well worth a look at. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, correct reading of the legislation. Um, apologies, Chair. I think I misunderstood the question. So that's all correct. That that's what's in the legislation. Thank you. Um, we just need to move an extension of time. Councillor Dalton, second. Comment. Would you like to no move an extension of time? Oh, yes. And I'll second. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Okay. And uh, co uh, question, Member Ashby. No questions. Okay. So we've. Uh, uh, I've moved, and Councillor Dalton is second. Is there any comments on? This item. Councillor Dalton, Deputy Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, look, it is a sobering report, and thank you, officers, for the report. Um, notwithstanding that we can't do this alone, um, this is our Auckland plan. And the progress report um, is sobering in the context of the budget proposal that we have out at the morning. So everything that we're trying to achieve in this Auckland plan, uh, or in, this, in the progress report so far. Sorry, Angela. But we, I'm getting quite frustrated by all these side conversations. I think it's quite rude to your colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> I think that, that is what Councillor Ferry was commenting about. Thank you. Councillor Dalton. So in the context of the fact that the achievements that we're trying to reach uh, form the $20 million that is proposed to be cut out of the budget that's out for consultation is concerning. And those areas include belonging and participation, Māori identity and wellbeing, transport and access, opportunity and prosperity. So this does come down to leadership. And I have to wonder, you know, when I listen 
up to around the table with our chair, we need to bring back some of these strategies and policies and plans that we have because the leadership has changed. And what I'm seeing in the budget is not going to be supporting the role that I think that Auckland Council has a really big part to play. And that is in resilient communities, social cohesion, jobs and employment, economic success, and, and the investment we put into those outcomes in the grand scheme of things. The $20 million and the, the cash flow that goes through this organisation is not a great deal. So what we have seen in, in the consultation documentation, and when, you know, referring back to the plans and policies, is really clear that the budget is suggesting, suggesting or telling us that we are not going to achieve the outcomes of thriving communities. We're not going to achieve the outcomes that are in Te Takere Otawhiri. We're certainly not going to achieve the outcomes in the Transport Emission Reduction Plan. We're never going to achieve the outcomes of the Auckland Plan, so who knows where we're going to be in three years' time if this is the progress at this point in time. So I think that at some point, Chair, we need to have a discussion as to whether before we start the 10-year plan, we agree as a governing body on what our vision is for the future of our city, because at this point in time, we're doing a complete pivot in the opposite direction as to what our policies currently hold for us. Um, thinking about partnerships and One of the partnerships, for example, is our contribution to Housing First. Now, that is a part, this is what we're good at. We are good at partnerships and we are good at leveraging. So we contribute half a million dollars to Housing First. We sit around that table with every other possible agency there is to address the issues of homelessness in our city. That's a good partnership. And that is good leadership, and that is caring for our people and our community and helping to build resilience. We need to agree if that's what we want or not. And if we don't, then let's have a debate about it. But let's not have a debate through budget cuts that are not going to help us reach our goals in the Auckland plan. Um, Chair, I think that the report, if it's not already, should be referred to the Minister of Auckland to have a read of. I'm sure he would like to have a read of that, but um, this is for Auckland. Uh, he is our Minister and he needs to have a good understanding of the challenges we have and the partnerships that we want and the responsibilities that central government have to us and our role in the advocacy with central government Something the Southern Initiative, which is about to get wiped off the face of the earth, does well. Three million dollars in their budget, and they leverage 14 million from central government, and they get people into jobs, and they help build Pacifica and Maori business and other things that they do. So um, the concerns I have are around what we're going to do for the next year, but more importantly. What are we setting ourselves up for for the next 10 year plan for our city of Tamaki Makaro? Thank you. Right on five minutes exactly. Thank you, Councillor. Um, very, very um, pertinent points. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Councillor Darby. Um, thank you, Councillor Dalton. Just following on that from that, so we've got the recommendation to the Minister. What worries me, and this is probably a, a question for the Chief of Strategy here is that a lot of this information, really important information, uh, you know, our policy settings, our strategic settings, don't often, you don't often hear them being mirrored back or discussed from finance when they come before us to discuss a budget. It feels like there's this little remote um, division that's in behind a moat of you know, impervious to to everything that Councillor Dalton has just outlined. You know, all the settings that we've made, it feels like it's impervious. So I'm just wondering, I haven't got the words in my head, Chair, but Chief of Strategy, maybe we need to actually refer this to the Finance Department too, and any quasi-cost accountant out there as well, because we're 
well endowed with cost accountants at the moment. We have very little uh, in the way of benefits accountants. Um, so not being too frivolous and light about it, but I, I do think we need to put this in front of the finance department. Through the chair, look, I know you're in debate, uh, so just block your ears for 10 seconds. Um, perhaps rather than uh, needing that as a recommendation, just know that Peter and I are talking already about the LTP, the process that will take you through for the budget, including this um, annual plan and how we can do it better and differently. So um, I absolutely will take that on and, um, and we will come back to you and, and talk you through that. I, I totally, Megan, you know I have absolute respect for you. I, I've sat around budget discussions for many years and I've found that um, when we get into the thick of it, um, the finance division puts a line through and I know that divisions don't get a look in. Um, they don't. And I hear it on the quiet quite, you know, repeatedly. So um, if, if that's going to carry on, um, then we are going to really lose the course that Councillor Dalton is um, highlighting that is, a, you know, severe risk at the moment. So, look, I, Megan, you're going to have to do your damnedest um, to make sure that they really do understand the severity of the situation uh, the inequity in Auckland is just rife. It, it's just in such a bad state. And when we've been identifying this for many years now, and it's actually not improving. We're, we're going backwards, and now we're going to put it into R for Rocket backwards uh, with the proposed budget. Leave it there. Kia ora, Councillor. Um, thank you very much. And that will be definitely passed along. Um, loud and clear. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thanks, Mr Chair. Yeah, I'd um, certainly pass this on to the Minister for Auckland. I, I, I don't know if he's going to thank you for it in election year, though. Persistent and deep-seated inequalities, inequitable progress against child poverty targets, rising cost of living, weakened community connection, health and well-being declining, Maori, you know, despite the biggest Maori presidents in the, the current cabinet, overall poorer outcomes in education, health, etc., etc. I mean, show that to the minister. I, I don't think um, that's going to be particularly welcome in, in terms of the clear governmental responsibility for, for virtually all of that. Um, certainly, um, in addition to the minister, we, we, we probably can pass it on to ourselves too. I mean, I look at maximising urban green spaces that improve the lives of people and planet. The last time a community came in here looking to hold on to their, their green space, we, we, we sold it, yeah. voted to sell it. So um, certainly it needs to be passed round because it is deeply disturbing. It, it's, it's, it's quite depressing uh, to think that that's the lot for uh, many people in Auckland. And, um, as it is, it seems to be getting worse. So I guess it, it wouldn't be so bad if it could be written off as a consequence of, you know, a, a short period of time. But we know it's, it's, it's a trend that's getting worse. Um, so it certainly does need to be passed around. Um, and there does have to be some sort of response other than the, the kind of usual hackneyed cliches that are trotted out um, time and time again uh, that really don't go any way to addressing how hard it is for many people now, many families, just to survive in this place. So, um, as far as the recommendation goes, Mr Chair, um, and, and I guess it, you know, it, people are quite right turning into the budget, but the budget isn't the consequence of just the last two or three months, it's the consequence of the last six years. Um, so, Certainly, I'm all for the preserving the, the community outcomes and the, the things that I know people in my community value and the people across Auckland. But let's not just uh, tie that into the last little while. That's been building up for six years, if not ten. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Newman. Yeah, look, I think that this report um, is interesting, but... It needs to be kept in context. 
Monday the 4th of October 2021 was the key date in my calendar. Uh, I was down at the James Cook High School Hall and we'd just finished a long day of vaccinations with the Mararao Marae. And at four o'clock we had a presser from the former Prime Minister who announced the big step town change for us to get out of lockdowns was picnics. And that's when social licence started to ebb because with that came a slow but important change in the loss of licence in relation to lockdowns, um, the appalling rollout of vaccine, vaccinations to achieve a really important outcome. But how do we get over the line with, you know, 90% double vaxxed? It was the annihilation of employment protections for thousands and thousands of workers. And, and, and we've never recovered from that. That, that's, that goes to the heart of the problem that we face. If you want to look at a declining confidence in, in governments, that is a significant moment, that event. Not saying I agree with all the decisions that took place. I certainly hadn't agreed with the protests, but that was important. Um, it's not so much important for the people in this room, we, you know, but it was important for people who were affected by decisions that they felt were being applied to them. It's an interesting report, Chair, because um, there's something for everyone. I poll my ward. 71% of constituents in my ward say that spending $300 million on cycleways is too much. 73% in Mararewa and 68% of response in Papakura. Now, that figure will cut no ice with it, some people in this room. I respect that. But people have their views and they have their values. <laughs> and unfortunately, sometimes you're going to get feedback that you don't like. But here's an idea. There are some things that we can control. Most of my constituents would like to have confidence that the bus timetable uh, is one that is going to be upheld, that there will be a bus service for them, that there will be a train service for them. Um, but, you know, it, if you want to look at something here, it's actually, to me, the first priority ought to be about Auckland Transport providing public transport services. They're very focused on active transport. I get it. It's very, very important to some people but it is not as important as other modes of transport to most people. And the reality is that we have policy after policy after policy. How many policies are funded? Talk about budget cuts. How many policy papers have we endorsed which are unfunded? Unfunded mandates. And then we set ourselves up year after year after year about this. I used to ask the former mayor, uh, Phil Goff, how are we going to fund these unfunded mandates? And there's never been any credible answer because I was talking about, well, it'll have to be a reprioritisation through the long-term plan. Well, when is anybody uh, who doesn't like a cut going to come up with a reprioritisation to fund all of these unfunded mandates uh, through that long-term plan refresh? It doesn't happen. It never happens. And the final thing I'll say, Mr Chair, and this is going to be difficult for some people, I'm sure, building back Auckland is going to require a significant outlay of carbon. And the hard reality is, is that the time when we had probably the least emissions in Auckland was during the lockdown, and most people hated that. And what we're going to see with uh, the future build back is it is going to be very carbon intensive for a time. And I'm sorry if some people hate that feedback, but that's just the reality of building back. Because you know what? Most Aucklanders are going to want uh, a degree of convenience in their lives. I certainly will, and so will my constituents. This report needs to be read for what it is. It is a statement about how difficult it is to live in a very expensive city and that there are lots of programs that we have which are unfunded, which undermines confidence in this council's ability to deliver. Thank you, councillor. Um, 
Yeah, so this is a, a, a look at what we've been doing as a city and what needs to happen. It is very clear, it is very bleak. It will, um, it's clearly got speed bumps in, in where we were heading due to COVID, due to the cost of living crisis, due to the Ukraine war, and now we'll have the floods and the cyclones that will affect this. But the underlying issue is, is that as a city, we have a lot of issues that we have not been addressing for decades. Um, and we've been trying to address those. And as Councillor Newman said, yes, we have looked to try and fund some of those things, things through water quality targeted rates, natural environment targeted rates, the climate action targeted rate, which is all about public transport and trying to get those services for our communities who do not have them and get them quickly. And for years, many people have said too much, too fast, won't vote for that, won't vote for this. Um, and this is what happens, is that we get a cascade of problems that our city is facing because we haven't funded them correctly. And now this is happening again. Um, so yes, I, I, I do love, um, and I commented on it recently, around the fact that people seem to think that the cycling budget is going to fund everything. Cycling budget's 1% of our transport budget. Uh, our, our cycling budget is one of the smallest in the world. Every international city is building huge numbers of cycling and walking uh, related infrastructure because it keeps kids safe. It reduces our emissions. It helps with air quality. It means that younger people and older people and those who don't have cars can get around our city. It's not anything that's sort of some lycra clad um, focus on, on, on random people in our city. This is what every school I go to, the kids go, I'd love to cycle to school, walk to school. I wish that my parents didn't have to drop me. We know during the school holidays that the traffic congestion is horrendous because everyone not in the school holidays is dropping their kids to school because it isn't safe. So I think that when I talk about um, cycling, when I talk about AT not following our um, plan after plan after plan, it isn't, it's bread and butter. It is, our, it is the things we should be doing as a city, planting trees, building um, transport systems that work for everyone, connecting up our city, making sure things are affordable and easy. And I think Councillor Watson might have talked about the half price public transport fares. But all the um, data out there says it isn't necessarily cheaper transport that attracts people. It's about making it easy, accessible, connected, and frequent. And at the moment, we don't have that as a city, as Councillor Watson had in his committee uh, last week or the week before, that we are losing confidence in almost every part of our public transport system. Um, when we talk about housing, we are getting there, the unitary plan, some people might not like some of the intensification, and that is absolutely correct. There is massive issues. But the whole idea of a compact city is the areas where we are building and Eki Panuku is focusing on and Kainga Auto is focusing on, places where we're doing it right, like Northcote and others in my ward, where you're able to build the infrastructure that's resilient, but also have a lot more housing connected to transport, connected to open spaces, that will all contribute to what, what we're focused on here in the Auckland plan. And I guess my question is, what legal constraints are we going to break by not doing these things? And I do want to have more information on that. So thank you for the report. It is bleak. There are some positives in there. Um, we've got to keep building on what we've been doing. Um, and it's up to us what we do in the budget. It's not an accident. What will happen through the budget, that's all up to us. Thank you. All those in favour? Anyone opposed? No.